Hello, and welcome to the Well Bible Reading Journey podcast. I'm glad you've joined us today. Uh, this is episode 43, and today we're going to be covering Numbers chapters 34, 35, and 36, uh, Psalm chapter 42, and Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14 is just packed with information. It's it's a fairly long chapter, but it, it, it only covers less than 24 hours, but there's a lot in there. So we, we can't wait to get there. We're going to cover... Uh, trying to cover numbers and then move right into Mark chapter 14. I pray that God blesses you as you listen in today. And I want to bring in very quickly, uh, Craig and Amber. Thanks for being here, Craig and Amber. Hello, hello. Thank you for having us. Thanks for all your work you did this week in preparing for today. So we have a lot to cover. Let's jump right in. We're in Numbers chapters 34, 35, 36, the very end of Numbers. We're, we're finishing out Numbers uh, today. For some people, this has probably gone really fast through Numbers. For others of you may think, wow, this has been a long time in numbers. But actually, for me, honestly, guys, numbers has been a lot more fascinating than I thought it was going to be. Of course, I've read it before, but uh, it's really been fascinating to dig in into some of the things that are behind why God is giving them these instructions and so forth and so on. And here we come to numbers 34, which could potentially, if you're not careful, it could be kind of boring to you because it's describing the clans and the the, the land and it's setting the boundaries right of, of Israel. Kind of God telling them this is what he wants to give them. It's the ideal picture he's painting, right? We know that uh, because we've read Judges and further on, and it doesn't go exactly as planned, does it? But this is what God wants for them. So, yeah, what did you guys get out of Numbers chapter 34? Or if you want to bring in 35 and 36, you can too. I'll start in 34. Um, this is, as you said, Ellis, this is God setting up the boundaries. And, and in a sense, it's him setting up the container of, or the vision of what he wants Israel to grow into, to, to grow, to fill, right? And, right. and we know that ultimately they don't get, they don't get there because of several compromises and they don't follow through on what he says, uh, you know, clearing the land of the people, of the native peoples for one. And that sounds like a good thing to us, but this is an example of where it, it can turn when we don't follow what God says uh, to the letter and to and honor the spirit of of what he's giving us and what he and how he tells us to get to what he has to find for us mm -hmm. how it can bite us in the in the rump and and kind of uh compromise our growth as 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 a people either individual people or a group of people right and in this sense god has said this is who i want you to be and this is how you'll get there and they don't honor that and they pay the, the consequence down the the centuries and millennia because of that and, you know, we can get in the sense of, you know, borders are good or bad. We've had some debates in our own country in the United States over the last few years about that very question. But this is a, this is a sense of a positive aspect of borders. You know, we're talking about the borders of Israel here, but we live with borders in our own life that define us as who we are as people, as individual people, as groups of people, either families or, or a church, for example. Um, corporations and nations deal with that, too. And the, the people of Israel themselves, uh, both as individuals and the people of God, they're given who they are through the law, ultimately. Uh, it defines uh, kind of who they are and what life looks like uh, for them and God. And that forms a boundary of, of what's acceptable and kind of what a good human life looks like and, and how they uh, operate the human being it, kind of from the, the perspective of the owner's manual, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, and it seems almost to be it plays into this idea uh, that we're going to see a lot in the in the subsequent in Deuteronomy and and, and forward um, um, is this idea of being separate and holy, and so this was super important. I mean, it's always been super important to God for us to be separate and holy, that uh, be able to tell a difference. There's this this maybe this boundary, if you will, uh, metaphorically speaking, around your Christian life that. That makes you separate, kind of separate and holy, and maybe different uh, from from this. That's the whole idea of being salt and light. You're supposed to be different, and so this is the beginning of that. And you see God setting it up here with his with his with his people. He's going to make them separate and holy. So you see a lot of God drawing boundaries, not just physically with geography, but also. Uh, tr the tribes and, and ethnically. And, and there are some people who misread into that, that we're not supposed to intermarry and all that kind of stuff. You're, you're, that's an anachronistic reading. You're reading, you're, you're, you're reading the wrong thing into it. 
what God is doing here is he's making sure that his people remain separate and holy because it was it didn't have anything to do with ethnicity, but with who you worshiped and who people groups worshiped in that day and time were so tied to their tribe, to their to their who the, who they were, that if you married into that tribe, you you didn't just marry the the, the woman uh, or or the man. You married their their family. You married their gods. You married mm-hmm. their culture. Right. It was it was the whole enchilada. It all came with it. Right. You couldn't separate it out the way we tend to do today. We might marry someone who's from a different faith, but oh well, we're just gonna you know we're gonna go back and forth. We're gonna do different things. But that's not the way it was in that day and time. So this was super important, these boundaries. It seems like boundaries uh, have always been important uh, for being able to thrive and and, and live, live out your life. Yeah, you have to have a sense of who you are and what, what your own space that defines you is about. And you can't do that if it's compromised or muddled with what other people's life and sense of self is about. Mm-hmm. Or even what you want for yourself, as we saw the boundaries of two, two and a half tribes defining their own boundaries for themselves. Uh, our boundaries have to be in line with God's purpose um, for our lives. It's, as you all are talking, they created their own boundaries. So not all boundaries that we put upon ourselves are good if they're not in God's will or his design. So we have no, to that's good. That. It didn't go well for them. Mm-hmm. Kind of not wanting to be a part of the of the 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 team effort there. Exactly, and, and that re- that reminded me as I started reading this week, as I started ch- in these week's chapters, I was reminded of last week's conversation with the two and a half tribes, um, where this is almost, if you think about it, a splintering of God's family, or at least disun- disunity at the minimum, um, mm-hmm. as they enter this supposed to be new Eden. They're supposed to be entering a new Eden, this new promised land. The land was promised for all of these tribes and it's a splintering. So you're supposed to pay attention. Like as we're entering in, this is a good thing. There's still a splintering happening and we're going to find the read over and over again, what that means for the, for the, the tribes as a whole. And that also reminds me that as we read these boundaries, um, we, they are listed here again, they, God did not add the East side of the Jordan here. He could, I mean, right? It's a consistency of scripture. We've read mm-hmm. it before. We're going to read it again. He does not add that boundary line. Um, he doesn't include it just because they decided to stay on that side. So that's a consistency of scripture I like. And also it reminds me that um, they did not earn this land. Let's re- let's be reminded right here, right now. They did not earn this. It's not something they did. This is freely given to them by God as an inheritance. So as we move forward, we need to remember that. No, that's a, that's a great point. That's a great point, Amber, especially the point about God doesn't change his boundaries just because you tied to do something else. He's not going to draw a new boundary around you to include you. You've decided to do something else mm-hmm. outside of what he wants for your life. Then it's going to be difficult for you. And you can always come back in, but sure. his boundaries are set and and and, and he's not going to move them just, just for you. I, I love that, that point off of this. And this is kind of what this chapter is doing, guys. It's setting up this... This is God's ideal. And if you live within God's ideal, you're going to flourish. He's promised them that they're going to have success. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be easy. Uh, the things that, Sometimes the things that are best for you are not easy. Uh, uh, Moses has given them the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments are not easy, but they're they're good for you. It's it's for your own good, as the, as the Scripture says. So whatever God gives you, it is for your own good. And he's set these boundaries for all of us. So then we move into chapter uh, 35 then, right? And we have the uh, the cities for the Levites, the cities of refuge. Very interesting what he's doing here. He's providing, number one, he's providing for the Levites. They were That was the one tribe that didn't get any land, right? And so he's he's setting up, they're not forgotten. And they, they, they have a special purpose in caring for the temple and the temple structure. Uh but then the cities of refuge, I found very interesting where he's providing there. He's providing for people who um, who accidentally maybe hurt someone or killed someone who they didn't mean to. Uh, and they're going to be avenged. The whole idea of this avenger, right? The avenger. It's like someone, if someone killed my brother and I was the eldest in the family, I had the responsibility of going and avenging my brother's blood uh, by by killing the person who killed my brother, that kind of thing. It was kind of the old wild, wild west, you know, situation where where you had to take the law into your own hands, but there were parameters. And here he's trying to, it's, it really shows God's grace. He's trying to protect the one who didn't mean to kill another person, right? So what did you guys get from the city of refuge? There's so, many, so much metaphor there, so many things you could look at. 
Uh, I'll uh, start by playing off something you just said about the Levites, uh, uh, Ellis. And if we remember that the Levites were given to the Lord in exchange for the for God's uh, claim on the firstborn sons of, is of the people of Israel, uh, so that the Levites could stand as a stand-in for uh, spilled blood, we really see the beauty of this picture and the practicality of it playing out. Uh, the Levites had this special family relationship that those who were seeking refuge could claim and find protection in. And then, of course, that extends into the picture of Christ, of what he does for us as our, uh, as our high priest. And when we are seeking refuge, uh, yeah. we're all sinners, so we're all seeking a place of refuge when we realize that um, we're guilty. And so where do we go? We go to Christ. as and he, he's, he is our living city of refuge. Yes, very good. As I caught uh, some of these um, relations between the refuge, city refuge, and, and Jesus being our refuge. And it's interesting the way that they're placed up, the way that they're placed amongst the um, the promised land is that they're they're never more than a half day's away. So no matter where you are, you can get to one quickly. And that's sort of this picture I see of Jesus. Like you're never too far away. No matter how far you might be physically or spiritually or how bad you think you've done it, Jesus is not far. He is there. He is within reach. That's another picture I saw of that, which I think is just a beautiful image of God. Yeah, no, it is. It's also kind of you see you see that allusion to uh, going back to creation and and the fall and Cain and Abel and C Cain kills Abel, yet he's given this place of refuge, right? He's given he's given grace, really. Uh, and so God puts the mark on him and says, you know, you you, as long as you stay in this this place that you will be uh, protected and no one will harm you. Right. Yeah. yeah, the same thing happened with the city of refuge, as long as they stayed there. But if they if they left the city of refuge before their trial, before they were exonerated or whatever. The thing is, before the high priest died, that, that the high priest had to die, that kind of thing. So there were parameters, but but if you left before then, all bets are off and the family can come get you, right? And so there, there's, you can imagine some of them are angry and wa just waiting for you to try to step out of that city of refuge so they can get you back. And it's interesting that they couldn't leave until the high priest dies, right? And it, that could, what a, you know, somebody might say, well, that's not fair. What if a high priest just got installed and they were young and they didn't die for another 40 years? Or on the flip side of that, what if somebody did you know, what if somebody accidentally committed this man manslaughter and the high priest dies two weeks later? Well, they're free at that point. Well, one, the Israelites would have seen that as a provision of God playing out. But two, that again plays into what Jesus does for us, and he never dies. And so, but we have can we have freedom within him, but we can't leave him. We can't leave our city of refuge. So in some ways it's still appropriate. Yeah. I as I was reading this, I kept thinking to myself, is this just about protecting the innocent. And yes, it is. It's partly about protecting the innocent, but verse 33 gives us a bigger why. What is this all about? Verse 33 says, um, so you shall not pollute the land in which you live for blood pollutes the land and not, an, um, and not atonement can be made for the land for, for the blood that is spilled upon it, except by the blood of the one who's, who shed it. And all shall not defile or make impure the land in which you are living, because it is the land that I dwell in the middle, for I am Yahweh, dwelled in the middle of the people of Israel. Okay, all of a sudden it got real heavy. Like when I got to that verse, I was like, whoa, there's a lot more happening. Um, you could just skim this. You're like, okay, he's providing refuge for the innocent. There's a lot happening here, especially when you start digging into all this meaning and all the symbolism that's going on here. The reason it's saying here is that you should not pop um, pollute the land. What's what's the land about? What is this? What is all this about? Why is that a big deal? Well, I started digging into it, and a couple of things popped out. One, let's let's be reminded that um, man man is Adam. The the word man comes from Adam or Adam, right? Adam. The ground is Adama, so it's the same spelling with an a at the end. It's Adama. Um, you have the word blood, which is Dom, which is the D-A-M in the middle. So um, Adam or Adam, um, Adam, which is the ground, and then Dom is the blood. And so what you have this image, if you were reading it in the Hebrew, it's there's a lot of things happening, what's going on. And what it's saying is God created man from the ground, from Genesis. God created man um, from the, uh, created Adam from Adam, right? From the ground. 
and that blood, when that blood, that Dom is put back into the ground, that is of, of your own doing, it is, it is polluting the ground. You are basically becoming God yourself. Mm. And so what he's doing is he's saying, I am Yahweh. I dwell in the middle of the people, which is the same word used that you see over and over again. God, Yahweh's in the middle. That's the, um, the Eden language, right? The, the, the trees in the middle, right? The temple is in the middle. God is in the middle. This is that same language. God is in the middle of this land, this new promised land. And you cannot pollute this land by becoming your own God and polluting the ground with the very thing that God brought man out of. And so is this, it's really this lot of depth here going on. So mm-hmm. yes, it's about the innocence, but there's a lot more going on here. In the Hebrew, there's a real alliteration going with yes. Adam, Adama, which is ground or earth and, and Dom, you're, you're right. There's just, when you read it in the Hebrew, it just pops out at you because you see it, the alliteration going on. It's really, really beautiful. So then, then we go to chapter 36, right? And, and uh, it's interesting. This is kind of this law that is still evolving because um, he's created the law uh, in, in the law of, of the boundaries, right? But here's something that potentially will start to skew those boundaries if a woman, if a if a young woman has an inheritance, her husband dies, let's say she gets the inheritance and she goes and marries it from another tribe or even from another people group outside of Israel, does does that inheritance, that land inheritance go with her? You could start to see how the boundaries would start to change. And some tribes might start getting bigger and bigger and bigger because as they intermarry, right? So this this becomes a problem and God addresses it, right? Yeah, it's really interesting. Like, I think you called it a living law and not mm-hmm. too long ago, like the, like the scriptures is kind of this, this living, adjusting. And I think it's beautiful that the Torah as a whole is this, is this law, but we have to remember that it, it changes and moves as um, we have wisdom from God. Like it, 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 it is ever changing. It is set in stone. The law is how we obey God. And the reason we should obey law should never change, but the law itself adjust as our situations change, as they move into the promised land, things are going to change, but ultimately it's all about living holy. That's what it's ultimately all about. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it absolutely is about not, again, polluting. That That's a theme that runs through this about not polluting the land. God is giving them this land and he is trying to, he wants them to be kind of pure and separated. Remember again, guys, we keep talking about this, but it, it, it plays out through the whole narrative that they are the only monotheistic people like in in the world, right? So they're they are monotheistic. Everything else is polytheistic of some form of polytheism. And it's so important for God to keep them separate and pure in their monotheism. They fight for it all, they're having to fight for it all the time. You see it happening again here where they're trying to keep the boundaries safe, right? Yeah. And I'll I'll say this could this could come across as an awkward way to end the whole book of Exodus, right? But yeah. You really, you really, it forms a book into what started in Numbers 26 when the second generation was first counted. And then immediately following that episode was the first episode or the first surfacing of the concerns of the daughters of Zelophehad. And kind of here we have the, you know, what could be a final reconciliation of the problem uh, or concern that was open in that, uh, those opening scenes of the second generation. And now they're, they're kind of getting their affairs in order. The second generation is, uh, as Moses is, kind of done with his his uh time here and they're getting ready to uh, head into the promised land head over to jordan and into the promised land yeah no good catch that's a real good catch it is it is a um a bookend to that to that section where you bring back in the daughters and you're resolving this this particular issue and then there's a brief summary at the very end like less than it seems one paragraph where he summarizes things and ends the ends the writing so yeah it's it's a great it numbers is really an interesting in-depth a great study uh, about how God is building his nation and his people, how he builds them up. Fantastic. Okay, so let's move on to Mark chapter 14. Because I said, it's packed full of stuff. A lot to cover there. Uh, it begins with uh, with the anointing at Bethany. Jesus, let me just remind you guys, Jesus is in the last week of his life. This is most likely happening on Tuesday of that week. Uh, uh, well, the, the the anointing does. Uh, later in this chapter, we move actually into Thursday. Traditionally, it's thought to believe Thursday. And uh, but it's it's Jesus is traveling from Jerusalem to Bethany each night to stay with most likely Mary, Martha, Lazarus, his friends there. And uh, and this anointing scene happens. So what'd you guys get from that? 
as uh, the storm clouds were gathering over Jerusalem in chapter 13, uh, yeah. now we have the storm clouds in chapter 14 gathering over Jesus himself. So, you know, we have the, the parallels between the two. We've been talking about the parallels between Jerusalem and the temple and in, on one hand and Jesus himself uh, on the other for the last probably two or three weeks. The past mm -hmm. three chapters. So now we're seeing all that come to a head and it's going to obviously it comes to a head in Jesus. But we're going to see how it all plays out in him, uh, ultimately leading to the crucifixion and resurrection. Um, but it's interesting to see that start to play out in in the actual yeah. historical narrative now. Yeah. Yeah. And this this is. This scene is reported in all three of the synoptic gospels, and you get a little bit from each one. But uh, we believe he's being anointed for his death here. In fact, in one of the gospels that he says that literally, she's anointing me for my death. He knows what's coming. I'm not sure she knew. She may have, uh, but uh, she she was. She, there's this sense of just her love for him, and and the uh, the expensive perfume that, of course, is what they. The disciples and somewhere else they blame Judas. Judas is really the one who was upset about this because he was the treasurer. He was stealing money from the. I think it's in Mark or in John that says that that he was stealing money from the treasury and this is why he was doing it. So uh, it's interesting that after this scene, when when Jesus basically rebukes them and says, "No, she was doing this. This was a good thing." That's when Judas says, "Okay, I'm done. Right, I'm done." And he goes and he talks to the. We see him going and talk to the chief priest and to the uh, Sanhedrin, and he's going to strike a deal with them. How much will you give me if I turn Jesus into you? They were looking for him. It's interesting. They were looking for him. It says, but they were afraid to arrest him because they were afraid of the people. The people loved Jesus. The people hung on his every word. The people saw the miracles. They loved Jesus. And the spirit, the, this, this elite leadership, spiritual leadership, very few people. They knew that the people loved Jesus and they didn't want to, they, that they might riot if they actually uh, arrested him. So they did it at night, illegal trial because of that. Yeah. This is, this is an interesting scene because I mean, throughout scripture, I know is divinely, I mean, God divinely inspired these images throughout scripture where even like you said, Ellis, even the person doing the act may not even know that they're it's picture of something so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's happening here. I think we see that throughout where she's doing something out of, out of genuine heart being pulled to do this. And it has so many images and, and pictures throughout scripture. So as I was digging into this anointing that she pours this oil over his head, um, this is so much more than just uh, that. And, and I love how the scripture, he at least Mark specifically, doesn't give as much attention to the weirdness that this would be for a woman to do this to Jesus. Like the focus is more on the 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 costly uh, of the oil itself, less about how awkward this like. Why is this woman? Because there was another um, another part in one of the gospels where there is a woman who also equally wipes oil with her hair. Um, it's a different scene. It's not the same scene. It's a different Mary. Right. It's a different yeah. woman. But she and they they rebuke the woman and Jesus rebukes them like no 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 she's yeah. doing this so i think that's why that's not focused on because they're not they don't care about the woman she's might even be inspir inspired by that woman she knows the story of that of that happening so she's doing this and instead you get this image of multiple things you have the you have a um, picture of um his burial he's get, getting a proper anointing for burial which he does not get from the cross he does not get a proper burial and then you have um a, a, a honorable anointing for his burial then you have the cross which is shame and then he gets ends up being in a tomb of a rich man which is like an honorable place so it's like this mark and sandwich kind of hidden here yeah. you have an honorable burial you have a shameful death and then in an honorable um burial um, burial yeah. and it's just this beautiful image here and also it represents the high priest and aaron aaron is the ultimate picture of the high priest in the old testament for us for the israelites and and there's a place in the psalms where they're describing aaron and how there was oil so much much being poured on his head that is running through his beard mm -hmm. that's not normal because in leviticus it tells them to anoint the high priest it is like a dab on the right thumb and the right ear that's all it was required mm -hmm. but here you have it's more than that this is like a pouring of so this is also something that happened with aaron in the psalms which is beautiful also it represents the kingship of david um because i think this representing of the uh, um, the kingship of david in the old testament because it was something done privately. When when David was anointed as as king, it was done privately, so the the leadership did not know because if they were to know him, he would have been killed. This is what's happening here. He's being anointed privately here. 
Mm-hmm. And I think there's an image happening where she was out of her kind of her heart was doing this thing that has so much beautiful imagery throughout scripture. Very good. Yes. Yes. You made a lot of great connections there, Amber. And actually I'd never really thought about the King David connection and you're absolutely right. And, and the overabundance, it's a, it's this kind of quixotic, uh, just extravagant kind of love that she's pouring on him, which would have been for some, and I think there were some, in one place she's called a, um, not necessarily a prostitute, but she's in, in one of the scenes, she's not a very, you know, um, uh, favorable like a, yeah. picture like of sinner. her. Yeah. Yeah. A sinner. But, yeah. but that could have meant anything for the religious, religious elite, mm-hmm. you know, but it, you could have not watched your dishes the right way and you're a sinner. Right. So, but, but the, the way they label her, she was kind of pushing some of these boundaries of, of proper society, if you will by even touching Jesus and doing this. So it was really, it was really extravagant and Jesus recognized that. Um, But Judas got very angry and some of the other disciples, they, they, they didn't like it. They didn't like it at all. So we move into the next scene. Oh, go ahead. Can I I make one last point? I just saw my note and I have a big star next to this note, so I shouldn't miss it. Um, I made sure to, it stood out to me that it said she broke it. I don't know why she broke it. I don't know why she didn't open it or she didn't like, like, like a seal. Right. I don't know why she broke it, but it seems to me that this 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 was intentional language to say why she broke it. I thought when I imaged this, I imaged um, this as a picture of Jesus's body broken and expensive oil completely poured out. It is Jesus, Jesus's body, his blood more valuable than anything that we could ever imagine completely emptied out for us here. Mm. Um, and in the world, just like these disciples do not see it worthy. Or, or, or worthwhile, that was worthwhile. And so is Jesus's blood being poured out um, completely. And Amber, I love, I love I didn't that. Think about, sorry, I didn't think about this until you just said that, but how providential that we just read in Numbers 35 in the city of refuge, what you just said about the, the blood being, uh, you know, polluting the land where Yahweh was in the middle of. Now Jesus is here spilling his blood to redeem and, and purify that land. Yeah. yeah. No, it's it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful connections, beautiful imagery, both of you guys. Uh, and you know, the idea of breaking something, you're not you're you're not saving any oil for yourself. You're you're gonna use it all. That's like commitment to use it all. I'm not even saving the container to maybe save a little bit for later. It's it's just yeah, spending it all on him. Uh, in the very next scene, of course, we have Jesus preparing for the Lord's Supper. It was obviously very strategically planned. Go over here, you're gonna find a guy there. I've already, you know, it's like Jesus had already prearranged this. If they ask you this, you say this kind of secret signals. Everything was actually very, very kind of top secret. That upper room, they were looking for Jesus. They were looking to get him and uh, they, and he knew it. And so he, it wasn't time yet. So it was very secretive, top secret. And they prepare it, they bring it and he does the supper. So some of the things, and there's so much we could go into here, guys, so much, but some of the, just a few things, guys, each of you that, that maybe you got out of this piece. First, Greg. Yeah, I'll say, uh, you know, just all I'll say about this section is, is the Passover meal was, um, it, it's a beautiful acting out of, of our faith, right? N.T. Wright fa- famously uh, said once that when Jesus talked about the atonement, he didn't give us a theory, he gave us a meal. And and the symbolism and what's happening underneath the services here and tying back to the Passover and, and our salvation and, and, and the Exodus uh, we, we've covered some of that before. We'll cover it more, I'm sure, uh, in future uh, podcasts. We're about to get into Luke, I believe. But uh, the, the symbolism and meaning here is so transformational and so explosive. You can't bind it up with words and theories and head knowledge. You have to act, you have to have actions around it and you have to live it out. Yes, very good. I have so many things that I want to say. I'm trying to figure out what's the most important. As I was <laughs> starting this section, something stood out to me that I've never read before. I've read it, but I'd never stood out to me. And I read it and it literally popped out on the page for me. I don't know why I never noticed it before. But in the section right before this, it talks about Judas and he goes and betrays Jesus and he's talking to the leaders. Mm-hmm. At the very end, it says we they promised him money and it says he left and sought an opportunity to betray him. Hold on. I was like, that sounds really familiar. I went back to Luke four. This is when Satan is tempting Jesus. And at the very end of Satan tempting Jesus, um, remember Jesus, I mean, Satan has a big hand in what's going on with, with, 
with the, with the cross and their, their one, obviously we know that this had to happen. The cross had to happen, but Satan still has his hand in it and with Judas. And what's funny is it's interesting, exactly the same language. Only other time mentioned it's in Luke four, verse 13, after Satan is tempting Jesus, it says, Jesus rebukes him, tells him to leave. And it says the Satan left and he was looking for an oppor- to come back on an opportune time. And yeah. I never caught that before. I was like, that is <laughs> yeah. so fascinating. So think with that in mind, I also stood out to me that Jesus uses this phrase, truly, truly, I tell you, right? This is an interesting thing that Jesus does. He's so unique in this way. And when he says that, he's basically proclaiming the truth of it before he says it. He's not saying it and waiting for you to proclaim, yes, I, I believe you, or yes, I declare that also true. He's basically speaking it as scripture. And what's interesting is he says it here one time. He says it many times, but one time it's interesting. He says it. And then he says, for one of you will betray me. He's literally speaking like that scripture. And I thought that was fascinating. It reminds me that he's saying it's going to happen. It must happen. And it will happen. This must happen. The betrayal has to happen. This is so important. And then you have the Garden of Gethsemane story next, where you see God, Jesus, literally walking towards and choosing suffering and choosing um, to walk towards the betrayal instead of retreating from it. So you kind of have the Satan image. You Mm -hmm. have Jesus reminding you that this has to happen, even though Satan thinks he has his hand in it. He has to happen. And then you see Jesus literally walking right into it. It's such a cool image here. Yeah. And the Garden of Gethsemane has always been fascinating to me. That is the next scene. Um, because in actually now I've actually been there to the garden and standing on that hill, you can see the whole Kidron Valley where the torches were coming for him, uh, when, when the, when they were coming for him at that point, but, the, but the, also the, the, the Mount of Olives and in, in that area is strategically located where you go down one side to the Kidron Valley and into Jerusalem, but the other side is an escape into the, the Judean wilderness where you can hide in any one of a thousand caves and they'll never find you. Jesus was sitting up there on top of that hill and it was strategic. He, when he's praying, Hey Lord, let this cup pass from me. If God says yes, then he's got an escape route, right? He he could have escaped. He could have escaped when he saw, when you're standing up on this hill and you can see down into the Kidron Valley, you can see anything that's coming up for you. And especially at night, they had torches. Um, he knew they were coming. He could have escaped. But to Amber, to your point, he chose not to. He chose to rock right into it, right into the the, uh, the hands of of his enemies, knowing that they were going to crucify him. It was actually a conscientious choice that he made. They didn't catch him. He gave himself to them, right? And you see that in the scene of the garden when they're arresting him here in Market. You again, every 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 gospel writer portrays this scene. So you get bits and pieces from the different gospel writers, but. We see them coming in, in, in Mark, he shows the, uh, someone taking out a sword and swinging, cutting off the, the, the young man's ear. In another gospel, we find out it's actually Peter who takes out the sword and cuts off the ear and he doesn't do it here. In another gospel, Jesus heals the man's ear before he rebukes Peter. So all that is happening. And that's when the rest of the disciples leave, right? When, yeah. G- when they find, figure out Jesus isn't going to fight, he's not even going to fight this thing, Right. Peter had promised, he said, I will, I will not leave you. I will not betray you. And then the posse comes for Jesus. And Peter was actually true to his word. He takes out the sword. He's not going to betray him. He's not going to run. He's ready to fight, right? Yeah. Let the rebellion begin. This is what we've been waiting for. Mm-hmm. He starts swinging and Jesus rebukes the one who's trying to protect him right. and he heals the enemy. Right. And in that moment, Peter is like astounded. He's like, He feels like Jesus betrayed him, right? Because how can you, you're getting mad at me and I'm trying to protect you and you're healing the enemy. And, and, and that's when Peter is out and all the rest of the disciples flee too, because they're, they're not ready to. So it's like, you know, we're ready to, we say we're ready to follow Jesus and we are, if it means me, you know, going out in a blaze of glory, fighting for Jesus. Yeah. Let me have it. And Jesus says, no, it means you laying down in some obscure place that no one's ever going to see you and laying down your life without a fight. And, you know, that's what I want you to do. It's like, well, wait a minute. (laughs) Yeah, That's not what I signed up for. It comes down to, it's like, yeah, I'm ready to die for Jesus and and be part of a group that goes out in a blaze of glory to your point. But sometimes living the solitary life of witness and and the her, you know, harassment, persecution, however you want, however you want to term it or however it manifests, that's hard. And that's what maybe that's what Peter is face, facing here and what he's uh, facing up to. But it's interesting as we get into the last verses of Mark that 
we see another set mark and sandwich between uh, and comparing contrast between what Jesus is going through and what Peter is going through. Jesus retains his integrity at the cost of his life before the council, but Peter loses his integrity to save his life before those who are accusing him of, of knowing Jesus. Yeah. And Mark is contrasting this vividly to show and highlight uh, Jesus's uh, solitary position. Only he can go through what he's about to go through. Yeah. Amber, I, I'll give you one last thing. We literally have a minute left. So one I'll last be, thing. I'll be super quick. I love to connect to Old Testament and New Testament. You know how I like to do that. And I've done a lot of comparisons of what people like Jesus. Here's one that's a little counter example. Counter example of Jesus is Adam in a lot of ways um, um, from Genesis 1. After the fall, I'm speeding up because I have a lot here, but real quick. I'm speeding up, but um, the curse is equal to um, the Jesus's cross. Adam's curse had three things, sweat of the brow, thorns and thistles and dust to dust. And Jesus is going to have all three things happen to him in the next week, in the next few days. Um, first of all, sweating of blood. That is the opposite of, um, this is the counter example. You're going to see the thorns on his head and you're going to mm -hmm. see him return dust to dust. Mm -hmm. All three things are going to happen. I, there's more there, yeah. but I'll leave it there for this. No, one. absolutely. Thank you. That's beautiful. You guys can make a lot of these connections on your own. You're super smart. As you go through it, just allow God to speak to you. And just sometimes if it brings something else up in the scripture, you go there and look at it and there's so much meat there. I pray that God blesses you this week as you study his word. God bless you.